This episode is sponsored by Hook Relay. If you integrate your apps with third parties like Stripe, GitHub, Slack, or Trello, you'll want quality webhooks that's more than just sending a JSON payload to your customer's URL. Hook Relay is a service that makes sending and receiving webhooks reliable, secure, and transparent automatically. You can watch your traffic, inspect each request, and much more. It's like X-ray vision. Without Hook Relay, you have no idea of how many requests you're processing. Of course, if your app or your integration partners are being flaky, you'll love the peace of mind that comes with knowing that no matter what happens, Hook Relay will make sure that your webhooks are delivered. Go to hookrelay.dev to get started and get reliable webhooks for your app in minutes, not days. In this episode, we're going to have an interesting look at lower-end computing hardware, specifically the Chromebooks, and how we can use these for a fully functional Ruby on Rails development experience. And before we get into this, it's very important to know that if you do have a Chromebook and you're wanting to go this route, or if you're in the market for a new Chromebook, you do want to check to see when these were created. Because an older Chromebook made before 2020 will not have some of the advantages that the newer ones do. Specifically around installing a Linux virtual machine so we can use VS Code for a more native experience with our editor. So if you're in the market for a Chromebook, just make sure that you grab the model number and you do a quick search to see when this was manufactured. And the added bonus of having a Chromebook that was made 2020 or later is that it will get eight years of updates and support. So this is the Chromebook that I picked up. I got it on sale for around 300 US dollars. And overall, it's not a bad machine. I do think it is lacking on the RAM a bit. The overall experience was okay. Once I got it booted up, I did notice that about three gigabytes of RAM was already being used. So you don't have a lot of room for opening up a whole bunch of Chrome tabs or doing a lot of multitasking. However, this Chromebook did come with a mouse, which is nice. And it also has a USB-C slot, which I did test out and it does work as a DisplayPort alternate mode, which means if you have a USB-C monitor, you can connect the USB cable to that monitor and have a much larger experience. So to get started, I booted up the Chromebook, I signed into my Google account, and I changed the wallpaper, and that's all I've done so far. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into the settings. And under the settings, in the advanced tab, I'm going to go down to developers. And it's important to note that everything that we're doing here is legitimate. We're not having to root the device or do any kind of sneaky workarounds that may not be supported in the long term. Because this is a 2020 or later device, we have this Linux development environment. If we turn this on, we can click next, we can specify a user and how much disk space we want to add. Depending on your situation, you may want to add a bit more disk space, but it shouldn't matter too much. We'll leave it at the default settings. This is going to install a Linux virtual machine and from there, we are going to be able to install any kind of application that's Linux based that we need to in order to do our development. And while this is installing, I want to have a quick mention of AWS Cloud9, which is a cloud based IDE, which you are able to run and then do all your development in the cloud. And we're not going to be covering this, but it is an option. And so the main thing that I want to highlight is when we go to create a virtual machine, around our development environment here, you'll see under the pricing that it's going to be X number of dollars per month for that virtual machine. However, that number is a bit misleading because when you're not using your development environment with Cloud9, it'll automatically shut it off within 30 minutes or so of inactivities, and then you'll no longer be charged that on-demand hourly rate. So something like a four virtual CPU and eight gigabytes of memory is going to cost about 10 cents per hour times 730, that's about $75 a month. However, in reality, you're not going to be paying $75 a month for that development environment because when you're not developing, the virtual machine would get shut down and then you'd be saving money. 
So you're only going to be paying that on-demand hourly rate when that virtual machine is powered on. And the same thing goes for DigitalOcean. Even though it says $48 a month, you're really charged for the powered on hours, which is seven cents an hour. And that's essentially what we're going to be doing. All of our code and the Ruby interpreter will be stored in a virtual machine in the cloud. And in my case, I'll just pick something like this $48 a month, which if I'm only developing a few hours a day, this should be pretty cheap. The only thing you'll have to remember with DigitalOcean is to come in and turn off that virtual machine when you are not using it. And you might be able to use a DigitalOcean command line app to do something similar. So the Ruby interpreter is going to be on the cloud. But then we're going to have the editor on the Chromebook. And in this case, I'm going to use VS Code specifically because of one of the features that it has. So scrolling down, we'll see a few commands that we need to run. The first thing that we need to do is to enable that Linux environment, which I already have. So we do have a terminal that popped up automatically. So now I can do a sudo apt update, and then a sudo apt install and the GNOME keyring. We'll let that install. We'll scroll on down and then we'll go to the download page. And you do want to take note of which chipset you have. If you do have a ARM64 chipset, then you want to make sure you're grabbing the correct binary. So I'm going to go to the download page. And in my case, I'm going to download the Debian 64 bit. This will download the file. We can just hit show in folder. We now have this file. I can double click on it and you'll see that it'll install the app with Linux. We'll go ahead and install this. And on the bottom right, we'll see a progress bar with it installing this application. And once it has finished installing, we can click OK and we can close everything out. I am going to pin the terminal just so I have easy access to that. And then I can go into all of the apps and I can locate the Visual Studio code. We'll open that up. Again, I'm going to pin this just so I have easy access to it. And then the trick here is that we're going to search for an extension. We want to find the remote SSH extension. This is an official extension supported by Microsoft. And this is going to give us this remote explorer. And so the nice thing about this is that I can create a new SSH target. And then I can just kind of follow along to do a SSH and then my username and the IP address that I got from DigitalOcean or any other cloud provider. And once we load up the remote development environment, I can press the control tilde, which will bring up a terminal. Or if I hit the control shift tilde, it'll bring up the terminal in a full window. And from here, I can install RVM or any Ruby manager I want. So I can do a RVM list to see what Ruby version I am currently working with. I can create a new Rails application. It'll go through just like it normally would because this is a fully remote development environment. However, I am using locally my Visual Studio code that is running in a virtual machine on this local Chromebook. So I have the application created. I can CD into that application. I could even type code space dot, and then it'll bring up a new editor with that SSH session connected, and then it'll bring up all of my code. And so I'm gonna bring up another terminal, and I'm just going to generate a scaffold. We can come into our config, into the routes. We can set the post as our root path. And then we can come over and just start our Rails application. So I'm going to do that with a bin dev because this is a Rails 7 application. And here's a really interesting part. We get this little pop-up that our application is running on port 3000 as available. And so what happened here is that under the ports, we can see that we have this port 3000 and it is now being forwarded to our localhost port 3000. So if I were to bring up Chrome, so now if we visit the localhost 3000 on our computer, we'll see that we have pending migrations that we need to run. We can run these and then our application loads. We can do whatever we need to do in here. We can test out our application and everything works just as if this were a native development environment. And so coming back to the application, we can see that we got the request and we can shut down the terminal and we can shut off this virtual machine. With a sudo shutdown now, I'll pass in the dash H, which will halt it, and this will turn off the virtual machine. So if this were hosted on AWS or DigitalOcean, then I would no longer be charged for the hours for this machine because it's not powered on. 
I would need to go into DigitalOcean or AWS's website to power on the machine. So that is the nuance that you would have to work with in this particular case. However, when we're talking about an affordable development environment, I really don't think you're going to get much better than this, especially for new hardware that has a long support life. This particular Chromebook would be supported all the way through 2028. However, it probably goes without saying that if you do have the money to invest in a better machine, then you're always going to have a better experience. I do find that the CPU and the amount of RAM on this particular laptop is lacking. It really is getting pushed pretty much to the limits just by having the Linux virtual machine running in the background with Visual Studio Code and a couple of browser tabs. So I went ahead and powered on the machine again and I've reconnected to the remote dev environment. And one thing to note that you didn't see on camera is that there is a lot of work that I did on the development machine to get things set up. I installed RVM, I installed Node, and I also installed Yarn. And so another nice thing about this is as we are developing our application and we're going through and we are working on a lot of this code, even as this application grows and becomes much larger, we don't have to worry about this computer slowing down because it's going to be the virtual machine that has a Ruby interpreter and that is fully remote. And if we find that we just don't have enough resources there, we can always scale it up. It will be a bit more expensive. However, because we're not keeping this virtual machine on 24 seven, it is going to be a much more affordable solution. And essentially what we're using this Chromebook for is a remote terminal. We have a few of the native applications that we are running locally for example, the Visual Studio Code, but that's really virtualized in a Linux VM on this Chromebook, and we also have the Chrome browser. But it's not always a great experience. For example, if I open up one of these controllers, then the syntax highlighting may not come up immediately. It might just come up as white text. It could take a moment for it to show up. But in reality, if I had a very shoestring budget, to where I wanted to get something that was still supported today and is going to be supported for many years down the road, then this is going to be a very viable option. You could always look at the refurbished market and get a similar spec or maybe a little bit better spec computer, like a Core i3 with 8 gigabytes of RAM, running Windows 10 or Windows 7 or something like that. However, you do have to take into consideration that those devices are probably out of support. You don't have any warranty on them and any kind of firmware updates are no longer being released for those products. And I did test this out for a little bit, running on an external monitor through the USB-C with an external keyboard and mouse that was plugged into the monitor. The monitor also powered and charged the Chromebook and I loaded the Drift and Ruby source code on that remote virtual machine to do some development. It wasn't always the snappiest experience. However, it was very workable if I was patient as some of the screens loaded and I was able to do quite a bit of work. And again, you could go with the Cloud9 setup. However, I really don't like it that much because you are then forced to use their IDE and you are within their limitations. However, we can go ahead and set one up and then we can look under the platform and you'll see that we're only given a few options here. We can use an old operating system that's about four years old now, or we can use the Amazon Linux too. Personally, if I'm developing on here, I'm going to want a better experience and I'm not going to want to have to deal with some of the nuances that come with Amazon Linux too. So I would probably choose the Ubuntu server. And for the cost saving, you'll see that you do have a few options for this environment and it can shut off as soon as 30 minutes of inactivity. But my preferred way for sure, if I am in a situation where I needed a budget computer, would be to get a 2020 or later Chromebook. I would try to find one that had 8 gigabytes of RAM. It's just going to be a much better experience. And I would enable the Linux development environment so that I can then install and run Visual Studio Code on there. Once I booted up the virtual machine, wherever I have it hosted, I can then just SSH in using the remote SSH utility and I'm up and developing pretty quickly. And another use case for this is maybe you do have a desktop machine that is relatively decent specs. You have Ubuntu installed on there or some Linux distribution flavor, 
and that's been your primary development machine. However, you need to be able to do your development while you're not at home. Maybe you have a few trips planned or you're going to a conference and you don't want to shell out the money for a laptop and you also don't want to have to manage two different computers. Then a Chromebook is going to be a great way where you have that flexibility because all of your code, all your settings and everything are still on that development machine that you have. All the code will reside there and you can just open up an SSH tunnel into that development machine so you can access it remotely via your public IP address of your home network. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching.